So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio and my YouTube channel. Uh, and I'm super excited to be joined by the amazingly talented Nikki Whalen. Thank you, Nikki, for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to have an English accent. <laughs> <laughs> my I mean, mum's actually English. Is so she? Her, she? Half my family are from Manchester, but my mum's been in Australia so long, it's kind of gone, so I love the English accent. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, we must say, because you're actually currently based in LA, in, in America. So for mm -hmm. you, what is life like with everything that's going on at the moment with the coronavirus and everything? How, how is life in, in LA? Um, it's... <sighs> This place is so damn big and there are so many people that, I mean, I don't know what network to turn on to get news. I mean, apparently we just went into another serious lockdown, but I don't, no one knows what that exactly means. This whole year has been, um, it's been pretty tough, you know, for, I mean, look, I'm in California. We have sun every day. Um, we've been, our laws weren't crazy, crazy like it has been somewhere. I uh, stay between two places, um, one in town and one beachside. So I went between the two through most of COVID and I was lucky in the sense that um, I had that, you know, I had the beach and we could still ride bikes and, and do a few bits and pieces. But I've been hearing some gruelling stories about what people have been going in. I mean, especially in London, in the apartments where you can't go out. It's, I don't even know, like... It feels like we're in one big movie. I mean, I will say humans are incredibly resilient um, and amazing at, at sort of change. We do adapt to change quite well, whether we like it or not. We've all sort of, it, it's like when cell phones came out. We, you know what I mean? Remember, we all lived without them, fine. Now we have them, but it's amazing how we just kind of evolve and keep going. But I think this on and off lockdown and what's going on and what vaccine and who and, and what is this virus and what where did it come from and these mixed messages across the world is triggering the fear in everyone and fear is like i think it might be the worst thing that anyone can carry and so it's been a um it's just for me personally it's been like i said i've had a little bit better probably than most people because of where i live but it, mentally it's been um incredible challenge I mean, I'll say, I'll say one of the positives that has come out of the whole situation is it has brought communities much closer together. I mean, yes. obviously, people are uh, helping the elderly and the vulnerable, doing shopping, doing, you know, anything they can do to help people who, who you know, maybe are less fortunate than themselves. So, I mean, would, I mean for you, you in LA, do you think it's, it's the same over there that you've noticed people have really helped each other more, that we've come together? <laughs> You know, what's the population in California? I think it's like over 40 million people. It's a big place and um, it's overwhelming. And I do hear what you're saying. And I think um, there's been portions of that. I think people have, um, you know, staying at home and having to reflect on things that we might tend to avoid in our lives, um, you know, keep ourselves busy so we don't have to sort of face a lot of our own stuff. This has been a time for that. And in those times of need I feel like there's been a lot of help groups zoom um, groups people really gathering together understanding that this is more than anything a mental challenge for a lot of people um, and I have noticed people gathering and, and sort of and there has been a lot of help but I, I it's just different in LA I know in Australia they Melbourne where I come from their lockdown was severe and um, people were getting really crazy on it like people were getting really really it's a lot of suicides I mean it's a very fragile time we're in like this is like a movie with no ending so i i i feel like there could be more but i i don't know what to do do you know what i mean i mean i've got a good team of people here um great friends but my whole family is in australia and i can't go home this christmas for the first time to be with them um so it's going to be a zoom christmas but it's things like that you know that I mean, it's, it, sad. <laughs> it's just, it's what, you know, it's, I think it's the first time in, in my lifetime, at least, that it, something has actually affected the whole world. It's not just a country, it's the whole world has been affected by this situation. And I mean, I've, you know, spoken to people in, in America, in Australia, you know, uh, early early back in april i was speaking to alan fletcher obviously dr carl oh. from neighbors and just talking about how everything had shut down at that point neighbors had completely stopped filming for a little while and it just it just affected the whole world so i mean for you with work wise how did it affect you work wise well the same everything just shut down completely every hollywood just got it 
you know, it was like done. And you know, us actors aren't the most stable people. We rely on working. And I mean, I tell you what, when Hollywood shuts down, <laughs> you would think the world's coming to an end. I mean, it's a whole nother, look, it's everyone suffered terribly from it. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of people that have beautiful homes and pools and sort of have a little bit of that, but to not make money, to not be doing what you love, to not be able to have a routine or have a, a sense of purpose, you know, um, has been shocking. And work-wise, you know, I'm lucky, touch wood. There's, um, I do tend to work a lot. So when I went into lockdown, it wasn't that I was panicking about work. Um, I knew we would eventually go back to it. I actually appreciated the downtime, to be honest. I'd been bouncing on planes. I'd been working so much. So to lock down for a little bit, it was more about the idea of not being able to just walk to a restaurant and have a meal outdoors and, and being deathly frightened of a virus that we know nothing about. So all of a sudden work for me got put in a different category. But for a lot of people relying on a weekly paycheck, people don't realise how many hundreds and thousands of people don't have three months advance money to pay rent, you know, and I know that they've got these things for people, but it's, it just doesn't matter. I've seen so many apartments go up for sale, people walking out of their buildings. I mean, people are leaving LA in flocks, like no one can afford anything. I just am a little bit worried about how things are going to be next year. Cause it's all sort of catching up after the lockdown lifted. I actually got a phone call. Um, to go do a movie in uh, Lake Tahoe, a beautiful location. And I went back to work and then um, I was jumping on planes. And then I, so the last couple months I did another, and then I did another movie in Kentucky. The last couple months has been a little bit adventurous for me. I've been bouncing around the country and working so lucky. I mean, these two gigs came out of nowhere and they were COVID safe, but even the movie sets are way different now. But now we're back into lockdown. I probably won't be seeing any work till January. So, you know, it's as actors, we do tend to have a little bit more time off than most people. But um, I mean, it's still, it's, you know, I'm usually getting on a plane to Australia right now. I'm going home. <laughs> I've never had an LA in, uh, Christmas in LA. So I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's weird. Now, I mean, the other thing, of course, is, you know, it's, it's given us a newfound respect for the healthcare workers, you know, people that are working on the front line. I mean, obviously here in the UK, we have the NHS and they're doing a sterling job. I mean, obviously in, in America, you know, have, have, has there been any kind of real appreciation for, for the people on the front line? There is. There absolutely is. And when you turn on, depending on what network you listen to and look, there's 500 channels here in America. When you t turn on TV, it's a mess. I mean, it's like, what is, I mean, it's, so wherever, you, you know, I, sometimes if I look at CNN or something, you'll see, you know, they do interview a lot of the, the nurses and talk to them and, and express their gratitude for it. But I don't think it's ever enough. I don't even know how you say thank you to those people in those situations. I don't even know. I mean, and then you hear about so many of them catching it. And I, I heard a crazy number about it. something like 37 nurses died from COVID from being, I mean, and the thing is, we're also not getting real facts on a lot of stuff. Information, you hear one story and then someone's got a different opinion and it's also, it's messy. But I think, you know, when you walk into those hospitals and see those people, masking up every day like it's terrifying um at some point there needs to be some sort of i don't know payback for them like a, a sort of a i don't even know how we do that um but they show up thank god uh it's just been challenging on a lot of people you know what i mean you just don't know what what's going to happen next i mean we're here in the uk we had uh, clap for carers which was a thing where every thursday night uh, at about, uh, about eight o'clock we'd go out and we'd clap on our doorsteps for the for the the uh the, the health workers and, and anyone who was on the, the front line <laughs> supermarket workers delivery drivers anyone who was still working we would do the clap uh, you know for sort of five minutes or so uh, a week um and I know sort of talking to other people, it's not, we've not had the same sort of things in other places, but I mean, you know, was there anything like that in LA? Not really with the way it's spread out and the way we live here, to be honest with you. Um, London especially has got these fabulous thousands and thousands of pockets and balconies and people who can have it. We've got downtown LA, which unless you live down there, you don't tend to sort of go in that area because it's just a whole different suburb. 
I mean, it's not sort of set up like that to do that. I'm sure there's been um, in the, some of the apartment blocks, things like that have happened. And, you know, I saw some beautiful people playing music in Italy on their balconies and roofs and things like that. You know, I saw things like that. But it's, again, it's so widely spread here. Um, it's not really had that feel. You have to sort of go on Instagram and social media to see those beautiful moments. I haven't personally experienced that here. Um, there isn't, it's just a different kind of community here. You got to sit in your car a lot to get places <laughs> and just feel connected. LA is a really funny city. It's not an easy place to live. Um, I've been here nearly 15 years. It's, it seems glamorous and some fabulous moments, but as a place to live, especially coming from such an incredible community like Melbourne, where that kind of thing is happening, you know, the apartments and Chapel Street and the whole thing, it's not, it hasn't got that vibe here, to be honest with you, not that I've experienced anyway. Now, we must go back to kind of where it all sort of kicked off for you. A lot of people here in the UK will remember you from your time on Neighbours. I mean, back in 2006, I believe it was, obviously you took on the role of Pepper, which to this day, I still love Pepper. I think she's fantastic. <laughs> for, for you, what were your memories of first joining that show and, and playing Pepper? I was a TV presenter doing sports shows and all sorts of things. And then the call came in to audition for Neighbours and I wanted always to be an actress. I was a dancer and I always wanted to be an actress. And I was like, yes, you know, because back then there wasn't a great deal of content, do you know what I mean, to, um, to, to really, there wasn't a lot of t original Australian TV shows, Home and Away. There was a handful, but it was, you know, few and far between. And I'd never acted before. So I remember auditioning for Jan Russ the most wonderful woman. And I had no idea what I was doing. I really remember going, I don't even know. I just want this so bad. And I'm just, so I just put my all in and got the phone call and booked the job. I, I don't even trust me. And I walk onto this, this incredibly, you know, amazing set of very talented actors have been doing this for years. I was so intimidated. And I was working with Ben Lawson, who's still a friend. He lives here in LA. Um, and he had just finished NIDA. You know, he's this amazing actor. And I'm like, so overwhelmed. But like I said, um, the girls were so wonderful. We all sort of got together. It's truly like being on a set with a family. You're there every day, five days a week. And um, I loved the routine. I loved the getting up at four or five in the morning. Um, you know, and then they got flew out Benji Hart from the UK who played um, Pepper's boyfriend. And him and I to this day are thick as thieves. Like he is one of my favourite people. And when he got there, we just had a blast. We had so much fun. I'm still friends with so many people from Neighbours. When I go home, sometimes I'll run into different people. And it's just that place really was so kind to me. I didn't stay out my full length of three years. I think I only did just over a year. But I had such a fabulous time and it set me up for everything else I've, um, I've ever done. I mean, I was mentioning to you just before we started that one of my guests uh, about a month or so, a couple of weeks ago, was Natalie Saliba, who, of course, played uh, Rosetta. Uh, and she was in the share house with, with you guys as well. So that must have been a lot of fun to, to work with her as well. And I mean, she was talking very, very highly of you the other week. I have some great memories with Nat. Her and I were really, really close. She's a wonderful, smart, very good actress. I mean, we had a blast and she taught me so much. Um, we have actually got to talk to her. We had so much fun. I forget, I've done, what happens is you do so much as an actor as you travel the world. You truly, you, it's so much for my brain to think of. But when I think back of our memories, oh my goodness, we had a ball. And she would come out here and visit for years. And I mean, you do make lifelong friendships on those kind of uh, soap operas. I mean, when you make the decision to leave, was that a tough one or did you kind of feel it was the right time? It's always tough, especially as a first time actress getting an incredible position. Um, you don't know if you're going to work again, but I did have an opportunity to do something very cool in Los Angeles. And my heart had always been here and I had an opportunity which was going to help me get visa work and stuff. So it was really hard because they made it quite public and, and a whole bunch of stuff. But I sort of just, for a couple of months there, I was a little shook about the whole thing, to be honest. But neighbours were fabulous about it. Like, they were so supportive. They get it. And, I mean, it was a smooth transition. You know, I wish I had started on Neighbours a little earlier in my life and uh, definitely spent a few more years on that set because I, I had a ball. If you were ever asked back, do you think you would go back in the future? I know. I always say this. Like, I don't know how I would bring Pepper back. I need all that hair back. Um, 
which I throw in sometimes. I, sometimes I wear extensions. Um, yeah, I'd probably go back and do it just for like it would be hilarious. I don't even, I think who I was as a person that age as Peppa trying to find her again might be really healthy for me because she was fun. I mean, she, she, she was a very like kind of nervy character. I remember she used to sneeze every time she got nervous. That was one of her yeah, traits. She, yeah. But she was very like spoke really fast, really over the top, really crazy. And that was a great deal of my personality back then. And I feel like uh, I've been living in LA so long. Just don't feel like Pepper anymore. But I wonder, <laughs> I would find it fascinating to drop back into that character. I think I would have to go really back and watch all my stuff and, yeah she was it's just weird how that reflects where you're at in your life um that would be fun yeah and it was amazing because obviously although you were only on the show for for about a year you did so much because i mean I, one of the storylines that sticks in my head was when pepper got kidnapped by i believe it was her ex-mother-in-law or something um oh gosh, she was kept in like a basement <laughs> So I remember, now that you say that, I remember doing that. I remember in this tiny set and I'm tied up in this fake fire. And I remember the, the, the challenges as a first time actor. The, I, I mean, you know, and they were so good to me. But yeah, that was very dramatic. So much took place. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I did. I, a lot happened in that year that I was there. <laughs> now, obviously, yeah. now, obviously, since you've moved to LA, you've had such an amazing career, you know, working with some amazing people. I mean, Nicolas Cage, uh, recently working with Bruce Willis. I mean, on Trauma Center, we must talk a bit about that. What was that like to film? I mean, it, it, every time I step onto a movie set, I'm working alongside people that I watched as a little girl growing up. Um, everything's always such a buzz. You know, it, it's, it doesn't matter how long you've been here. You do tend to get a little bit sort of, you know, you can leave the house and see a lot of sort of, oh, wow. Yeah. So you do sort of get, a, it becomes a little bit more normal, but to perform alongside some of these actors is a whole different ball game. And I've done three movies with Nick now. Nick's fantastic and that he's one of the best actors in the world um bruce i mean growing up watching all his movies i'm obsessed with the fifth element so when i met him i was like yeah yeah can we just talk about the fifth element i was <laughs> i needed to know everything about that movie because i'm i just love it and he's just um he's such a character and you know when you work with these people a lot of the time you sort of go oh i get why you're who you are they're so charismatic and charming and so good at their jobs and you just just a really fun experience and sometimes you don't realize what's happened until you have left and you look back and you're like yeah that just happened like it's it's cool like that's the part of my job it's really nice and you learn you work differently you feel differently when you work with those people you know it's really special is there like a, a dream producer or, or or actor that you would love to work with in the future maybe someone that you're a huge fan of that you haven't had chance to work with yet yeah Daniel Day-Lewis and he retired. <laughs> I just don't know what I'm going to do. He's over your side of the world. <laughs> he is by far, I actually met him once um, at an Oscars party and I was like, oh, I was like so excited. Because my whole year was made meeting him and he was so delightful. You know, he might be by far one of my favourite actors in the entire world and his work is just brilliant. And I know I don't think he'll ever come back and I don't think I'll ever be able to, the kind of actress that can work alongside him. But, oh boy, that would be a dream. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously being, you know, an actor, you can play so many different roles. But I mean, is there a role for yourself going forward that you would love to play? Some, you, know, is, you know, is there a particular type of storyline you would love or is there a character you would love to play going forward? You know, I, the people ask this a lot. A lot of the adventure, half the adventure is getting scripts that you have no idea what they're about and sort of going, I want to do that. There's that kind of thing. I don't have a major drive to pace anything specific. I kind of like what comes in and it'll, some things will just draw me in more than others. Um, I would love to do a bit more comedy. When I first moved here, I did a lot of it. And now it's, I've been doing a lot of thrillers. I, I've, I've been killing a lot of people. I've been killed a lot. It's a wrap. I want to do a little bit more fun stuff, but the com they don't shoot comedies the way they used to. And there's not a lot of it around, but boy, I'd love to get back on a uh, comedy. <laughs> They're so good. They're the funnest sets to be on. I mean, yeah. So that would sort of be, to answer your question, somewhere I'd like to go back into more of. Because a lot of people might not realise, but comedy is a very difficult thing to get right because obviously you have to get the timing so perfect. So yeah. I imagine to, to, to be on a really successful one and to really nail it must be such an... You must be sort of quite happy and proud when you, can, when you do it. Mm, there's a, um, 
there's a lot of timing involved. And when I first moved here, I did a, um, a HBO special for Funny or Die. It was this kind of thing, a three episode thing with Will Farrell. And I did a lot of stuff. And I was like, you kind of, I'm so busy laughing at what he's doing. You know, it's a whole thing, but you see the way why they're so, they're like masters at it. They're so clever and he'll ad lib so much stuff. I mean, so many of them, um, you know, Kevin Hart and Josh Gad and um, David Spade, all these crew that I used to work with are so clever. Um, it's a tough business to be a full comedian. I mean, you know who does a great transition? Rose Byrne, another Australian actress. Love her. She can go from comedy to drama. I mean, she is cr like nails it as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge. And I just sort of started to get into it. I did a great pilot for NBC, me and Scott Bakula, uh, Christine Woods and Brenda Song. And it was fabulous. I love sitcom. It was the greatest. And that required a lot of timing and stuff. And I learned so much in that pilot. And I, yeah, I just got so much out of it. I'd love to do more of it. It definitely is a thing. And also, you know this, is English humour and Australian humour is so different to American. So I'm, it's not a lot of times I'm like, this isn't funny. But they all laugh and I'm like, hey, okay. Like it's a, they're really different to our sense of humor, like way different. We got to be careful how we do it. So that's also a challenge. And then the American accent on top of that. Because that's the other thing is obviously you, you, you have managed to master so many different accents. I mean, for you, where do you, where do you kind of draw the inspiration from? How do you teach yourself different accents? Because I mean, I, I'm awful at anything. <laughs> No, you know, I, I had a couple of voice classes when I first moved here. Um, some days I sound Irish when I need to be American and it's all over the place. It's because when you change your accent, everything about you changes. And it's very hard for me to change my accent and still feel incredibly real about what I'm doing. It's, there's this, and your tone of your voice, everything, it's a real thing doing accents. It really transforms you and you've got to find stuff in it. I've had days on sets where I'm like, I, I, I can't talk American today. I can't, it just, I want to come out. Like it's, I always have, it's language and, and the accents has been a real, a real thing. And, um, but I've got to be American in most of the stuff I do. So it's really, it's always a challenge. I, I mean, a lot of people just do it easily and it's fine, but it changes who you are and you have to mold that into the character you're playing as well. It's, it's a, quite a task, I think anyway. No, I just want, yeah. just, I just want to say it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I could continue for hours. Um, but before we go, have you got any messages yeah. for anyone who's currently stuck in hospital at the moment, who's not having the best of times, any messages you'd like to give to them? Um, first of all, I'd like to say you're tougher than everybody else. Um, I, I mean, we all sit here complaining about being in our apartments and homes and you guys are in the thick of it. You're also in a very challenging environment. And I feel like I, there's not, no matter what I say, wouldn't be sincere enough to really understand what you guys are going through. I think aside from COVID, when people are in hospital, I'm sorry, my phone just dropped out. Um, I think aside from COVID and just in general being sick in hospital and fighting for your life, there is, it's always those places you walk into where there's people with the most spirit and the most light and love. And I think there's this sense of when you get ill, you realize that the most important thing is your health. And um, I, I just think, you know, I, I wish there was access where we could see more of them in hospital and speak to them and be able to communicate back and forth and see what's really going on. So, um, to anyone that sees this and anyone I'm speaking to, um, yeah, and you're so resilient and so incredible and you're leading the way in so many ways you don't realise. Um, well, I'll send my love and uh, I hope you've enjoyed chatting or listening to my stuff. Um, and I wish you very, very, very good health. I just want to say, Nikki, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved talking to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Of course, keep safe and thank you again. You got it, love. No worries. <laughs>